Thanks for everybody to come. Nice to see a good crowd here. Also nice to see some of the nanophotonics honor students. So I'm glad I couldn't destroy your interest in the field completely. Anyway, so we're going to hear a little bit more today about nanophotonics. And I want to introduce, first of all, what it is all about and why it is interesting to try to combine light with very small spaces. Yeah, so why would we want to do that? And the way to start, if I get this to work, yeah, I always like to show this image. So this is one of the masters of the control of light, more from a photography point of view. So some of you might know this lady, Berenice Abbott, very famous photographer from the last century, mainly for her photographs of the transformation of New York City in the 20s and 30s. So here we have Grand Central Station and you see that light is a very big element of this photograph. And if you look at her collection, which you can explore online really nicely at the Museum of Modern Art and the Met, you will see that many of her photographs have light as a very prominent ingredient, yeah, almost as important as the actual subjects of her photographs. What is a little bit less well known about her is that she made actually also really beautiful illustrations for physics textbooks. And these are two that I particularly like to illustrate the problem that we try to solve with nanophotonics. Yeah? So we all know that if we are above, so we all know light is an electromagnetic wave, yeah? electromagnetic radiation. So, and as any wave, we can control it in a very easy manner if we are above the wavelength scale. Yeah? If we are far above the wavelength scale, well, reflection and refraction, right? As we see here at a prism, yeah? as the canonical example. So light is very straightforward to control. If we are at the wavelength scale and below the wavelength scale, of course, then things get much more difficult, right? Because we have to now look at really the wave nature of light and we have to be concerned with diffraction, uh, with diffraction and with interference, yeah? Which is here nicely shown, clearly not with a light wave, but this is a water bath, two little tapos, yeah, that um, generate these water surface waves. These are separated by a distance significantly smaller than half the wavelength of these. And you see here the um, interference pattern. Yeah? And the problem is now how can we control light on such a small length scale? So first of all, why like, would you want to do that? And there's basically three different reasons that I, that I want to show you here with. So if we find a way to do that, we can, co we can confine light in a very small area. Yeah? So one of the key elements, as I will show a little bit later on, are nanostructures, either made out of a metal or out of a dielectric. And if we get them to interact in a very strong and enhanced way with light, then we have enhanced absorption, we have enhanced scattering, but crucially, we will have in the so-called near field zone. So that's uh, the area surrounding the entity that we have designed that interacts strongly with light that is much smaller than half the wavelength of light. Here we now have an, have an enhanced near field. Okay, so you can think about it. So we um, try to make a nanostructure that uh, interacts strongly with light. Light bounces at it from the uh, far field. We have absorption inside, we have enhanced scattering, but we have this near field zone where we now have an enhanced mainly electric field. And the way you can think about that is that also light rays, if you think hand wavingly in the ray picture again, that would otherwise not interact with this object are now drawn to it. It has a much higher cross section for the attraction of light, so to speak. So we can have highly enhanced near fields now. And if we are now able to controllably bring materials, in like this example here, uh, sketches of molecules, into this near field zone, then we can enhance light matter interactions. Yeah? And we can en enhance them depending on how they scale with the uh, quality factor of this resonator, if you think about this as, as a resonator, uh, or with the mode volume, yeah? or in a more easy way, well, how do they scale with the amplitude of the electric field? And here you can see some examples on, of like how extreme this effect can be. And I will uh, describe a little bit later how these images were formed, because clearly these are not optical images, because if you look at the scale bar, we are way below the diffraction limit of visible light. Yeah? So these are TEM images of silver nanostructures. You uh, see the uh, scale bar here. And here we see um, mappings of these electric near fields when we excite them at their resonance frequency, where they show this enhanced interaction with light. And even though these are false color images, this mode here actually corresponds roughly to orange light. Yeah, so we're dealing with a wavelength of about 550 nanometers and you see we can controllably get a field hotspot here in an area well of a few uh, nanometers squared. Yeah? So this enhancement of the local electric field is one of the key mo motivations 
for nanophotonics. Another one, if I can manage to wake up my remote again here, yeah, is control over the propagation of light, playing with Snell's law. If we just remind ourselves how um, reflection and refraction works, right? We can like think about it really nicely and like really like easily in like the Huygens surface wave picture, right? So light impinges on an interface here. You all have um, learned. Um, the, uh, students here maybe quite um, recently how we construct the wave front in the adjacent medium here, right? We um, form these um, spherical waves and then take the tangent here. But if you think a moment about what actually happens is light impinges on the surface here and sets off a superluminal, right? Because this distance here is obviously larger than the wavelength within one cycle here, a superluminal electric polarization wave on the surface, right? Governed by the uh, real part of the refractive index, I have re radiation into that medium here, and this then leads to my, well, to my curved face front. But that also shows us how we can manipulate Snell's law. If we can manipulate the speed, the superluminal speed at which this red arrow propagates within this one cycle. So if I'm able to, let's say at like this point here, give this arrow a little face kick or delay it a little bit, then I can change the way that the wavefront looks on the other side. But clearly in like order to like do that, I like need to put here elements that interact strongly with light that are itself much smaller than the wavelength. Because the distance that I have to play with here, well, obviously it depends on the angle of incidence, but um, it's on the order of the wavelength. Yeah? So tricking Snell's law yeah, into not what we, what, we, what we know, right? The like typical Snell's law, but adding this particular phase factor here via nanostructuring the surface here is another big like motivation of basically generating controlled Huygens surface wave sources, if you want. Yeah, and like this way, you can, for example, get negative refraction. You can get cloaking. Um, yeah, there was like a lot of interest, particularly in uh, this part about well, started really 15 years ago. And of course, then you can also make flat lenses out of it, right? You can then think, okay, the face profile that you need for a lens, you can now encode onto a flat interface if you can yeah, kick this arrow in face space, so to see around at will. Yeah? So we have the enhanced field, we have tricking Snell's law, and then the last one is more in a context of energy con conversion. If you have an entity that interacts strongly with light, for example, in like this case, say metal particles, yeah, then we can use it as a way to convert energy from the photon field into other forms of energy. Yeah, I've already shown you the enhanced near fields that we can get around such a metal nanoparticle. We have also enhanced absorption, which will ultimately lead to enhanced local temperature. So we have a little nano heater. Yeah, there's a lot of research going on, uh, um, particular at a cancer hospital in Texas, where they make such metal nanostructures. They make sure that this interaction doesn't happen with visible light, but with near infrared light. And um, it's at the moment at stage three clinical trials for prostate cancer, for example. So you choose a wavelength that is transparent to the body. You make sure that this absorption and heating happens in the near infrared and you attach it to cancer cells and you just heat them up by a couple of degrees to induce natural cell death. Yeah? Not everything will get lost to heat. This little guy will also start to vibrate. So now you have a little nanoscale mechanical oscillator that you can then use, for example, to launch locally an acoustic surface wave on a surface. I will show one example later. And another example from energy conversion is if you use a material that has catalytic activity, you can, you can enhance the catalytic activity. So you can use the absorption to generate electron hole pairs and then, for example, locally induce redox reactions on your um, structures. Yeah? So it's enhanced fields, it's steering of surface waves, and it's finding a way to locally take energy from the photon field and convert it into another um, form of energy. Yeah? Yeah, Dimitri? Uh, what motivates to choose a triangle shape? Mm. Um, uh, purely because, okay, a um, little bit a, a so, if you have uh, additionally a, so like it doesn't need to be a triangle, but if you additionally have a pointy, surf, uh, a pointy corner, then just as with the lighting rod effect, you additionally get field line crowding. So the field enhancement is particularly high, but it doesn't need to be, yeah? So now I will show you examples from all of these three areas, yeah? So first enhancement of interactions of light and matter, then a little bit of what we can do with control 
of a propagation of light and mode conversion and in the last few minutes I hope I don't go too much over time a bit about using that for energy conversion particularly in a context of photocatalysis okay so like let's start with that um, enhancing interactions between light and matter very briefly first though let me state the um, problem yeah so the problem is the diffraction limit which of course you have with any wave phenomena right you can just think about Fourier reciprocity you can think about it also uh, with um, photons obviously from Heisenberg uncertainty principle but this is actually like a really nice way to think about the diffraction limit coming more from an optics viewpoint so it's a very nice paper by Jacob Kurgan from a couple of years ago a commentary in um, nature nanotechnology so if you if you think about your e uh, electromagnetic wave at at the moment and like everybody that's tried to run an electromagnetic simulation knows that the way that you propagate a wave in the time domain is right you calculate the electric field you take Maxwell's equations from that you calculate the magnetic field the electric field and you leapfrog um, your way uh, ahead yeah and behind that is that of course if you have a propagating e electromagnetic wave or in fact a well-behaved cavity and with well-behaved I mean a cavity yeah like a little mirror cavity where we can draw our well our usual standing wave in here then the electric field energy is equal to the magnetic field energy and they have coherent exchange be between the two but they are equal in size yeah and that's kind of the secret why I can like you know like propagate dipole all of that if I now make my cavity significantly smaller than the diffraction limit I force the electric field now to zero by basically just squeezing the cavity yeah that leads to an enhancement of the electric field but the electric field is now significantly higher than the magnetic field so I now have an imbalance between the electric energy and the magnetic energy and I can't dump in my next step all of the so if I think about it in a computational way yeah of course this is hand wavy but I think well at least I like this way of thinking about it I can't dump all of the energy that I have in my electric field into the magnetic component so the only solution to conserve energy is the cavity radiates yeah and this way we are again at the diffraction limit so how can I get around this I can get uh, I can get around this if I find a physical process in which I can deposit this electric energy yeah so that I say now the electric field energy is not equal to the magnetic field energy but it's equal to the much smaller magnetic field energy plus something else and the key is what is this something else yeah and in nanophotonics a very nice way to do that is you couple the oscillation of the electric field to a plasma oscillation in a metal nanoparticle so the energy of the electric field is now mainly taken up by kinetic energy of this electron cloud here of these free electrons if you think of it in a very simple druid way moving back and forth yeah and this way I can maintain again energy balance and I can make cavities that are much smaller than the diffraction limit of light of course the price that I pay is that I have movement of charges so I have absorption happening yeah drew the damping all of like the normal damping processes but those I can then use for example for energy um, for energy con conversion now to the to the theoreticians in the room of course you can make the whole argument also by saying well actually an equally valid solution is if the magnetic field dominates over the electric field but in like reality for that to be the case you would need dielectric materials with a very very large n much larger than is available in in um, uh, in naturally occurring materials so for all intents and purposes this is what we need to do yeah so we need to take the electric energy and couple it to something else and the two uh, meta excitation that we can couple it to so we're going to form a polariton now I will mainly focus on this one here we take metal nanoparticles we couple the electric field to the movement of the electron cloud in a metal particle and we set up what's called a plasmon polariton yeah so mixed light matter modes where we have the electric field coupled to plasma oscillations mainly this is done in the good optical metals so silver gold copper it's also very interesting to do that in 2D, ma uh, in 2D materials as well so you can have this in graphene you can have it in highly doped semiconductors you can do the same in the mid infrared by not I will not talk about that today but over the years we've also done some nice research there um, you can also couple it to the displacement field by coupling to transverse optical phonons if you have a polar material such as silicon carbide and then you form po uh, phonon polaritons and you can basically do almost everything that you can do with visible light in 
with plasmon polaritons in the mid-infrared. And of course, that's extremely interesting because in the mid-infrared, the diffraction limit is even worse in practical terms because the wavelength is now many microns. But that's exactly the window where you want to do biodetection, where you want to detect plastics explosives, where you want to have good night vision, yeah, where you maybe want to play something with energy conversion. So that's why phonon polaritons are very interesting. Of course, you can also cheat a little bit and say, OK, why like bother with all of this? Let's just take a high index dielectric, yeah, good old silicon, germanium, a 3.5 semiconductor that has a high N. Yeah, so N is on the order of 3.5. Let's not beat the diffraction limit, but let's make a nanostructure that's just on the order of the first order mode in here. So half a wavelength in the material here. And this way you can also generate enhanced electric fields. So like this is an SEM image of um, two gallium phosphide pillars and you would also have an enhanced e electric field around here. And if you then, for example, bring a fluorescent emitter close to this, this will enhance the emission from this fluorophore as well. So now here you don't break the diffraction limit. It's still very interesting because, um, first of all, it deals with dielectrics. So uh, semiconductor technology knows how to structure these. And the big difference here that I will mention very briefly a little bit later on is in dielectric nanostructures you can also have magnetic modes. Whereas in these polariton structures all of the modes are uh, electric in nature. So you have an electric dipole. Here you can also have a magnetic dipole. And if you then play with the interference between an electric and magnetic dipole you can do um, very interesting things. I'll show you a little bit something later on. Yeah, But let's focus very briefly on the um, plasmons here. I just want to show you some examples. So one, um, so one par, uh, uh, particular early example of uh, using these strong light interactions, these plasmons, plasmon polaritons, or localized plasmons as they are also known, is the coloring of glass. Yeah? So this is one of the earliest surviving examples. You can see it in the British Museum in London in the permanent, co uh, permanent collection, the so-called Lü. Kogos Cup, late Roman Empire, early Byzantine Empire, I think 300, uh, um, yeah, from uh, 300 after Christ, I believe, 150 after Christ. Um, it looks like this in reflected light, it looks like this in transmitted light, yeah, so basically if we um, um, unplug the power of the British Museum and we take a um, flashlight and we shine light at it and we look at the light that's coming back to us, it looks green if we break the box that it stands in and we put a candle inside here and we look at it then it looks red and the reason is that uh, this contains metal nanoparticles in this case mainly gold or also some slight uh, alloy with silver that has this strong interaction in the green. Yeah? So green light interacts strongly with it, it gets preferentially scattered back to us, that's why it looks green. If you place a candle in it, the white yellowish candlelight comes out, green light gets preferentially absorbed, scattered outside the line of sight, so the whole thing looks red. Yeah? And um, any, uh, and any um, sort of glass that you see, as long as it's real glass, and unless it's blue, where it's, I believe, an ionic absorption, the color is usually due to metal nanoparticles in it. Yeah? And the way that you can now um, shape, so to speak, where this interaction happens, that's determined by the shape and the size of this metal nanoparticle. Yeah? So if you are in London, you can, you can see this for, for, for free. Okay, and again, so like the way like that we can think about this happen is so we form this polariton, yeah? So the electric, uh, the electromagnetic wave comes, have a small metal nanoparticle, small enough compared to the skin depth in the visible, so that the field can penetrate throughout the particle. This curved surface um, acts kind of as a phase matching condition, you can think about it. So, right, you know from your solid state physics course, uh, bulk plasma wave, longitudinal in nature, doesn't couple to light. This here couples to light due to the fact that I have a confined space and I have a curved surface. So I can couple now my plasma oscillation to the transverse electric field. As long as this is not on the order of just a few nanometers, which it usually is not, because then the interaction would be too, sm uh, would be, would be too small, simply because we don't have this, we cannot think about it as a continuum plasma oscillation anymore. And we are at room temperature. It's nice, all of our quantum mechanical levels are so closely spaced compared to KBT that it's all classical, it's nothing else than a mass on a spring. Yeah? So one way of thinking of how this resonance arises, 
you can use the mass on a spring model and you can say okay if I am at very low frequency we all know um, the electrons in here will start to oscillate so as to expel the field if you are at very high frequencies they will instantaneously follow the field so I have phase shift 180 degrees I have phase shift 0 degrees somewhere in the middle again hand wavy but it works I will have pi over 2 phase shift and my motion of my mass on a spring will get enhanced yeah and of course a moving electron cloud yeah we radiates so I have my enhanced scattering of light and I have my enhanced absorption of light so the colors that I get here yeah so you can use this for color generation um, and then you have these enhanced fields yeah and like this is then where things get really interesting because you these little particles now basically almost act as antennas for radiation and I can choose the frequency in which this antenna attracts light by shaping the particle yeah which I can do either via colloidal synthesis or via brute force for example electron beam lithography to make these little silver triangles of course we are below the diffraction limit so we can't see these fields yeah so like how would you see this field? Well, that's where electron my microscopy comes in. You, I mean, all of this here is really just polarization of this electron cloud, right? So, so which is here now given via the far field. So it will excite a mode that can couple to the far field. It will excite the first bright mode. This whole thing just moves coherently up and down like an, like an electric dipole. But the excitation yeah, doesn't need to be a plane wave. It can also be a line current. So if I put the whole thing into a transmission electron microscope and I position my electron beam, let's say here, the retarded fields around this electron beam will now polarize the electron cloud in here and now also set plasmon oscillations in motion. And the nice thing is now, if you think about what this is, this acts kind of almost as a delta function, right? I give the whole electron cloud a kick and now it will oscillate not only in the first order bright mode, it will oscillate in a superposition in principle of all possible modes that it has, right? Just like having a differential equation and probing it with a delta function, right? Meaning that you not only get um, the uh, mode that gives it the color out, yeah, but you also get higher order modes yeah, that you can excite this way. And this is quite interesting because if you place, of course, a molecule here or a fluorescent emitter, this will also act like a delta function. This will not just excite the coherent kind of boring up and down motion that you would excite with a plane wave. This will also excite dark modes, modes that don't have a strong dipole moment. And you need to know about these modes if you want to do any sort of engineering. For example, if you want to use this guy to re-radiate strongly the fluorescent emission of this guy here, or maybe reshaping the field. Yeah? So using this technique, which is called electron energy loss spectroscopy, so the whole thing is in a, uh, is in a TEM. I scan my beam over my sample. I record by the uh, electron lenses and the monochromator and somebody that really knows how to, uh, how to fit such yields spectra here. The energy loss, I will see all of these loss peaks. Then I put my energy filter around such a loss peak and I do the mapping and then I get the modes out here. Yeah? And you can see these beautiful symmetries here of the first three order modes. Yeah? So here you're mainly on the outside, a little bit in the middle. This is the mode that gives it the color. So if I look at this under a microscope at glancing incident angle, this, this mode will determine, so the spectral position of this guy will determine the color that I see. Yeah? These two modes I will not see because these are dark, they don't have a dipole moment. Yeah? But you see here, for example, you have the energy mainly at the corners and in the middle and here really nicely on the side. Yeah? So these are things that we can do here, for example, in, um, in um, MSEM. Okay, and then um, just some like other like examples. This is already quite like early work. We did this with IMEC, with Paul van, van Dorpe. You can use now such um, interference on maybe a little bit more interestingly shaped metal nanoparticles, so these boomerang or V-shaped type structures. If you come at it with light on the top, plasmon modes get excited in these two arms and they now interfere so that the light gets, gets scattered preferentially just in one direction. Yeah? You can use it also in reverse. You can put fluorescent molecules next to your boomerang and um, excite it again. Sorry, my remote is acting up again. You can excite it uh, now from the 
outside again, but now you look at the fluorescent uh, emission and we thought, okay, hopefully the same thing will occur. It's quite interesting. The interference still happens, but it now happens in the opposite di direction. Yeah? So if you put molecules exactly at the right spot here and you excite it, yeah, they get re-radiated via plasma modes in this um, structure, but in the opposite direction to which the far field light gets scattered. So here you see four different examples. Um, the uh, scale here I believe is 50 nanometers or something like that and the black area here is where we have deposited our fluorescent molecules. These are the different lengths of the arms. So you see uh, there's a lot of engineering. The arm needs to be exactly at the right length and you need to put the molecules exactly at the right position so that your interference happens to preferentially scatter light in this case to the right. Yeah? So for the experts here this is just a basic Fourier case space case space imaging. Yeah? So you can make such unidirectional radiation routers. What else can you use such structures for? Well, this is now the first example with a dielectric structure actually. So this is not a plasma mode. This is simply uh, two gallium phosphide disks where we excite first order normal electric resonant modes. Yeah? But you also have an enhanced field around them that you can that you can model shown here in the two different polarizations. So you see if you polarize along the axis we have an enhanced field again here and now you can use this for example to enhance the radiation of light um, from a 2D ma uh, material. Yeah? So you can take tungsten diselenide, a monolayer, put it over this um, structure, it gets strained, it spontaneously forms single photon emitters, um, basically well at the like side here and you can enhance the, e e the efficiency of this luminescence process yeah, by about three orders of magnitude. By basically now overlapping the um, resonance of this pair of these two little disks, which you see here in like these curves, one shows the absorption resonance, one, one the scattering resonance with the exciton of either a single monolayer or, a, uh, uh, or two um, monolayers of this thin 2D material. Yeah? So like that's one other um, very fruitful area coupling such structures to 2D materials, right? 2D materials are naturally very thin, so you would want to have light uh, highly confined in order to interact strongly with it. Yeah? What you need to do, this is now like really old work, but I'm going to show this for like a reason, you, you need to have really good control of the positioning of your matter element. Yeah? This shows another example of third harmonic generation, so where we use a little disk of a material called indium tin oxide. If we illuminate it, in the um, near infrared, yeah, there's a third order mixing process here um, that's happening. So we get third order harmonic light. Yeah, so light now in the visible, yeah, at like a third of the wavelength, three times the, uh, the uh, frequency produced in this little guy and then scattered out. We can enhance this process by like about a million if we build a gold antenna around it, so two bars of gold so that this hotspot of field enhancement at the, at the excitation frequency nicely overlaps with this disk. Yeah? So between single disk and disk decorated with this gold antenna, yeah, as you like often call it, leads to an enhancement of third harmonic generation by about six orders of magnitude due to the enhanced field yeah, taken basically to the, to the third power. But this is what I want to show you. Yeah? If, if like this little disk just moves a tiny bit out of the spot where uh, the field is maximum, so right here in the like middle, yeah, so just from the middle here to like a little bit of the outside, so your nanofabrication didn't work so well, you like see the scale by here, this is I think on the size of maybe 30 nanometers or so, look how quickly your like signal drops, yeah. So location is really everything. So for that you either need to have very good top-down nanofabrication, multiple alignment processes, or you need to be able to very cleverly play with chemistry if this would be a colloidal element so that you really guide it to where you want to be. Yeah? So it's very nice to have light in such tight spaces, but the price that you pay is of course, well, you like need to be able to get what you want into that space. And of course, if you think about using this for biosensing, right, you might think, well, that sounds very nice to maybe combine with microfluidics and nanofluidics, then you will of course always have the problem, especially if it's a liquid, how do you actually get it in here? Yeah? And how, if you think about biosensing, uh, how can you make sure that you don't get false positives or so. Yeah? So like there's a lot of, lot of nanoscience and nanofabrication in this. And now like just lastly, for um, this first part, I um, 
mentioned that if you don't really care about breaking the diffraction limit rigorously, but you just want to confine light on a scale of, let's say, 100 nanometers, 50 nanometers, or a little bit below, right, you can also just make um, small resonators out of a high index dielectric. Yeah? So this, these are little disks of germanium. Uh, and the nice thing with a dielectric particle is that now you not only have electric dipoles, but you also can excite magnetic dipoles. Yeah? Again, for like the experts, this goes back to Gustav Mies' work from the early 20th century, where he looked at the scattering of light by spherical objects. Yeah? And of course, this like whole like theory of these electric and magnetic modes, particularly like the higher order ones, is what's all behind of mod modeling how radiation interacts with aerosols in the like, atmosphere. But the nice thing is now with like these particles, even though you kind of don't have the ultimate field confinement and also the electric field enhancement around the structures will now be less with like a metal. It's basically just you're in the quasi-static field regime. So the most you can enhance the field is via the index contrast inside and outside. Yeah, so 3.5 squared. Yeah, epsilon counts. But the nice thing is you now have an electric dipole to play with and a magnetic dipole. And you can now with very simple structures, even like just with disks, you can have very interesting e effects if you get these two dipoles to interfere. For example, if you overlap them, you can have you at the so-called Kirker condition and lights get scattered only either in the forward or in the backward direction, depending on how you arrange it. Or in like this par in like this particular example, we um, interfered. Um, an even stranger version of this mode, the so-called toroidal electric dipole mode, which is basically the mode of like a solenoid, again for like the students here, but now think it's now such a solenoid mode oscillating at optical frequency. This is a so-called toroidal dipole mode. If you get that to interfere with the incoming plane wave, and you can do that simply with a single disk of a dielectric, you get an excitation that's a so-called anapole, and that's something really interesting because the scattering is basically suppressed. So you now have an object where most of the energy gets absorbed, but it's basically almost invisible to light. Yeah? You can still excite it because it's not a mode. Again, for the experts, it's not a mode, it's an interference. So as, as soon as you would shut the plane wave off, this would not work anymore. But this way, you can get a lot of light inside the dielectric. And this is, an, this is another big advantage of this. Here you have the fields inside the material. So for any sort of nonlinear process up to electronics, we actually want to get the field inside you can use these. Yeah? So what you see here, just briefly, is third harmonic imaging. So we excited these disks somewhere in the near infrared. We looked at the third harmonic signal, so light emission at visible frequencies, scanned our excitation wavelength around. This is the profile of the electric energy that you would expect for this mode, and you see it nicely um, coincides with this envelope here. Yeah? So enhancement of all sorts of nonlinear light generation processes, dielectric particles, uh, a very good way to do that. Okay, I like, need to speed up a bit, which I will now. So now briefly something about light propagation and mode conversion. So now this is now the la a second part. Yeah? So we now are not interested in the near fields. We are arranging now our little nanostructures of like whatever form of like a surface in order to change the way that uh, these uh, spherical Huygens waves interfere and we shape wave fronts. Yeah? And the work that I'm showing here, um, he's unfortunately not here, he, he's at Clio at the moment, is um, by Hao Ran, who some of you have met, my um, DECRA fellow, and the work that I'm showing is that he's done with me in Munich previously. So, so he has used such um, wave front shaping in a context of holography, okay? So to make basically holographic disks, yeah? where um, he uses such tiny elements uh, basically as a way to encode com computer-generated holograms. And the particular challenge is to make this process, um, um, first of all, efficient and uh, also to multiplex it. So that you have many different images that you can encode in such a hologram. Yeah? So you can think about what different degrees of freedom could you use. Obviously, you could change the color, you could change the polarization. Um, what Haran is really like an expert in is uh, to choose the orbital angular momentum of light. Yeah? So we're not going to deal with um, normal plane waves now. We are now dealing with helical wave fronts. And the idea is that such a hologram now will encode a different image for each different helical wave front. 
Okay, so that we then, uh, and well, so the like challenge was is we basically wanted to like reconstruct like a small movie where we say, okay, we like stay at the same wavelength, but we change the helicity of our light beam, let's say from minus 50 to zero, okay, and like each of these different uh, topological orders now has one image en encoded, yeah. Um, again, just briefly, like I don't have time to uh, go like into this, but uh, there are like, there are, like, are like some problems here, so um, if you take the Fourier transform of a helical beam, you arrive at a donut shape, okay? So if you're not careful and you sample your image too, um, too, too closely, you will get all of these different donuts to overlap yeah, between the different modes and you get a lot of scrambling. So you will not get nicely shaped beams, yeah? So like what you need to do is you need to take your image, let's say of this rocket, you will need to say what's the highest order ob orbital momentum mode that you want to encode it with because that order L determines basically the radius of this ring, okay? So you need to now convolute this with a DRR, with a Dirac comb yeah, of this pitch basically. So, so, so you need to sample it in order to have a hologram where when you illuminate it with such an orbital angular mo uh, momentum beam, the mode order is conserved. Okay, so that when you come in, let's say, with an L equals minus 2 beam, so helicity minus 2, the mode that you get out is a nicely formed donut, yeah, for all of these different orders, yeah. So, like, what you lose with this is basically spatial resolution. You, like, need to do this sampling here. Okay, but now, like, obviously, you, like, don't want to see donuts. You want to see nice light spots, yeah. So, like, what you can do now is, because all of this works in the Fourier plane, obviously, so now you can make, uh, you can just convolute this, so like multiply it in Fourier space with a, with a spiral phase plate of the particular mode order so that now for your mode, let's say again, equals minus two, you now get a nice um, Gaussian spot out, okay? And only for this particular mode. For all of the other modes, you would get destructive interference. Okay, and like this here was like the final work. So um, uh, Haran's uh, big contribution here was to make this work for um, holograms that not only work on the face but also on the like amplitude so that you basically don't see the diffuse images but you see different brightness and for that you like need to play both with the face and you need to also have control over the amplitude and the way to do that is to now make little resonators that also have different heights because then you can use the height degree of freedom to operate on the amplitude so to speak and the orientation of these elements to, to orient uh, to um, work on the face, okay? And the idea was then, okay, so we generate such a face plate, we encode two different movies in it, so that at one distance without a camera, we can play back one movie, and at another distance, we can play back another movie. All with one plate, we scan it at the same wavelength, but we change the helicity of the beam from, in this case, minus 50 to 50, yeah? So this is a real simulation of this, um, um, of this of this process here in like Fourier space, yeah. So you see, so we change the he the helicity, and we would get these little movies back. Yeah. The like nice part is all of this is in the Fourier. All of this works in the Fourier domain. Yeah. So the lens function to actually form this image can be integrated in the plate itself. Yeah. So you can do all of this lensless. Now, um, okay. So just briefly, again, how you do this. So so you take your image frame. You need to sample it with this right pitch so that you don't get this destructive interference. But then you have another problem, and those of you that do photography know that, right? Our eyes have a huge dynamic range, right? Something that we could never really capture here. So like what we do is we also have a little random diffuser array here to basically compress um, the values between light and dark into a much smaller space, yeah? So we play with a contrast slider and we reduce the a contrast to make it washed out a bit. But then we know our amplitude and phase distribution via a simple inverse Fourier transform of that. Then we multiply it with the particular spiral OEM phase of the mode that we want to reconstruct it with. And then we multiply it with a Fourier lens. And we do that for uh, the two different distances that we want to construct our movies at. Yeah? We combine everything and then we get one distribution. Okay, this is the amplitude, this is the phase that we need. And then we um, discretize this with our little nano resonators and then we are there yeah? and then we have these movies. So what we used here is a simple polymer. So we use spiral fringe and polymer. We made these little pillars to discretize this. We have um, eight different orientations of the pillars to work on the face. 
we have oops, excuse me, eight different heights of these pillars to work on the amplitude. What you here see is uh, cross polarization plots. We have length versus height. This shows the amplitude of the scattering of such a pillar. This shows the phase of scattering. And this black arrow, yeah, this is the range of different heights and orientations that we play with. And the important part, and the important part for all of this wavefront control is, we need to cover all of 2 pi phase space in order to get the image reconstruction. Okay, so we like discretize it like that. We uh, put it into a 3D direct laser writer and we write for about 40 hours here, I believe, or like 36 hours to have in the end our holographic face plate here. Yeah? So you see different orientations for playing with the face, different heights for playing with the amplitude, and these are the two movies. Yeah? Obviously not as fancy as the movies before, but here you see a rotating triangle, here you see a rotating spiral. Yeah? So this is directly imaged on a CCD because the lens function again is already via multiplication in Fourier space encoded in this um, image here. Yeah? So like this is really nice. Um, yeah, and Haran did this when he was on a Humboldt Fellowship, who he, so he did his PhD here with Mingu at RMIT and then Swinburne and then joined me in London and now, and now he's here. And we'll do great things, no doubt. Um, just like one like other example of like what you can use, a very similar uh, approach for is if you fabricate such a polymer structure with, with different heights, for example, of an end facet of an optical fiber, you can do something really interesting as well. You can use the orientation here again to help you form a focus and you can use the different in heights to compensate for the group velocity dispersion that you get for the different colors that you um, put into this fiber here. So you can make an achromatic lens, an achromatic flat lens. Okay, so like in this work here, um, Haran showed that by playing in the right way with the height and the orientation of these um, elements, you can basically get achromatic focusing, so like a really nice focus over a very uh, over over a very large range, so 400 nanometers right in the um, telecom window. Yeah. So here you see the characterization of the focus. Both well, this is the focus spot. This is a side wave view, and you see that for all of these different wavelengths, yeah, you are exactly at the same position. And like this is a real challenge. Yeah, I should maybe like point out. Yeah. And then like you can like use this nicely, for example, for con for confocal imaging with white light in the near infrared with like an optical fiber. So these are chromatic lenses here. You see, not very nice. This is the achromatic achromatic picture here. Yeah. And this is what it looks like. So this is the optical fiber, then how run um, generated also with the same polymer, a little expansion um, tower, because you need to expand the beam a bit to get the right numerical aperture. And then he put his metasurface on top there. Okay, very briefly, what else can you do with um, metasurfaces? Um, I want to quickly talk a little bit about now a planar surface, where we again take two little elements and we excite a particularly interesting mode. So like this is a mode and in order to explain it the easiest is it's a mode that doesn't exist if um, the elements are in perfect symmetry. So if I take two little bars and if these bars would be like this and I excite a dark mode in it, so basically dipole moment up here, dipole moment down here, um, I would not, well, I would not be able to excite it from the far field because the dipole moment is zero. But now I tilt them ever so slightly, so I have a slight asymmetry in it. And this way I generate now a dipole moment. And this dipole moment, uh, and, and uh, this now has a very sharp quality factor. So this is a very sharp optical resonance. Yeah? It's a so-called quasi-bound state in the continuum because it's a mode basically that um, is um, very similar to what like, happens in a, uh, in a strained asymmetric quantum well, yeah, it's basically a like bound optical mode in the continuum space. And like the easy way to like think about this is you like start with a dark mode, you introduce just a little bit of symmetry and this way you come go basically from no mode to a very sharp mode and you can control now this quality factor just by changing the angle between these two elements. And like why is this interesting? Because this way you can play with the strength of the coupling from the outside. And then you can all sorts of like um, really cool, cool like engineering. You can uh, get into a condition called critical coupling where you're able to couple, for example, as much energy as possible into this little element 
if you match the coupling constant, so the sharpness of this mode, to your coupling constant from your, from your outside, outside space. Yeah? So you can do this, for example, to um, generate a very high efficiency chiral reflector. Uh, so here, and this is on a review still at the moment, here we generate the, uh, the uh, symmetry, not via an asymmetry in angle or like an asymmetry in, um, in um, uh, length of these two elements. Yeah, so the trick is always you start with a dark mode, equal dipole moments. You need to change one of the dipole moments, either via angle or via changing the length here. But you can also do it, for example, via changing the height of one of them. So if you then arrange this in like a chiral, chiral fashion, so either left-handed or right-handed, depending which of these bars you make higher, yeah, you now either have very high re, uh, reflection for left-handed polarized light or right-handed polarized light. So you can make a planar um, chiral, chiral cavity with a, um, with a depth of this transmission or reflection peak, depending on how you arrange it, on the order of 90%. Yeah? Um, you can also do this if you want to think about more. Uh, can I maybe have electronic control there? Yes, you like could. So you could also, if you are able to change the permittivity of one of these elements in order to introduce an uh, symmetry here, you can also generate these very, very sharp modes ele electronically. So you would not, not play with the geometry to manipulate one of the dipole moments, you would manipulate the uh, symmetry. Yeah? And this here, this, um, the, uh, this is going to come out in Nature Materials in one of the next few weeks. So here we like use this concept to demonstrate strong, um, strong coupling via engineered sharp modes such as this and um, overlapping them with an uh, exciton in like this case in a uh, few layer tungsten dye selenide. Yeah? So again for the exports here you can really nicely see the Lagrabi splitting here. Yeah? And again the like, trick here is that we are able to generate these really high quality resonances via playing with the, uh, with the uh, symmetry of our resonating elements. Yeah? So like, this, is a very, um, this is a very highly uh, sought after topic at the moment, these quasi bound states in the continuum since it gives you access to really high, to really high quality factors. Dimitri. Uh, could you return to this picture with, uh, with this beautiful picture of bound state in the continuum with the potential? Yeah. How to reconcile these two pictures? How to understand this, this quantum mechanical picture is relevant for such structures? That they have something similar. Yeah, uh, yeah so, so, uh, so, so like you, would, you would like do that by like basically saying that like your like dark mode yeah, isn't existing yeah so you have a continuum of modes in that space and now you um, and like now you like change that by a slight uh, symmetry which would you then which would you then which you would then decompose into like a set of Fourier decompositions which would which would lead to like a potential such as this yeah but it's complex so we, so like we should talk about this um, offline because I'm running a little bit behind time here okay so like lastly just um, very briefly, so we've talked about interaction of light and matter, enhancing them via light hotspots, via, via steering of beams in the last five to, to ten minutes, I'm afraid. Um, very briefly, energy conversion. Okay, so now the idea is we have our little nanostructure, we can shape it in a way so that it interacts in an enhanced, in a strong way with light, and now we can use this in order to convert energy from the photon field via, de via design into something else. Yeah? So one example is um, into um, our acoustic surface waves. So if you take a metal nanoparticle, this will show a simulation at the moment. This shows a quarter of the simulation volume. We have a nanoparticle here, we have a nanoparticle there. We excite a nanoparticle from the outside with a light wave. Plasmon gets generated, plasmon decays, the particle starts to vibrate. It gets hot, but also it starts to vibrate at gigahertz frequencies. This sets off acoustic surface waves. And then we thought about, well, how can we de 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 attack this? So we put a little, a second metal nanoparticle a little bit farther away and we do pump probe spectroscopy now, but we pump here and we probe here. And what we see is, so the experiment looks like this, this is our pump particle, our probe particle, a couple of microns away. If we look at the transmission of light through this tiny probe particle here, which is enhanced because this is chosen at the plasmon resonance of our probe beam. So the probe beam is chosen to coincide with the plasmon resonance here. We will see, depending on the distance here, oscillations 
in our transmitted light through it. Yeah? And these oscillations occur at gigahertz frequencies and are, uh, and are due to the fact that we have set an uh, acoustic surface wave, in like this case on glass. So these are two gold particles. This is glass, yeah? and it's basically an acoustic Rayleigh wave that we set into motion here that then sets this particle into motion. And like you could think, okay, why on earth would you want to do that? Well, we also don't really know, but um, <laughs> uh, I mean, like one like area would, for example, be bio D, bio D detection. Yeah. So if you uh, put molecules on here, yeah, they will change the gigahertz frequency that this guy vibrates in. Obviously, if this would be like a piezoelectric substrate, it would be much more interesting. Yeah. One example that we have done with this is you can nicely read out the Young's modulus of anything that you put on here. So if you put a little blob of polymer over this particle, yeah, you can reconstruct what's the Young modulus of that polymer because you will now get an acoustic impedance change around this particle which will change the oscillation frequency, um, the, the like strength of the oscillation that you see here. Yeah? So here an example, energy conversion from the photon field into E into E essentially lattice vibration and in this case Rayleigh shear waves. Yeah? So this wave here is at, a, is at a fraction, just at the fraction that you would expect for an acoustic surface wave of the speed of light in um, silica. Okay, and now for my last example, and this might look complicated, but it's actually not here now. I want to put everything together to show you how you can now really engineer an energy conversion process. Okay, so now we are looking at a context of photocatalysis. So what we want to do is we want to have a layer of material that strongly absorbs light to generate charge carriers, and we then want to use the charge carriers to catalyze a reaction. Okay, so uh, typical reactions that one is after is uh, ammonia synthesis, CO2 reduction. Yeah, so in a in a context of like energy and like and like obviously the like motivation is we have the great energy source of light. Yeah, we need a lot of energy for fertilizer for yeah, we really like everything. How to do that in a more efficient manner? Can we engineer this process? Okay, now. The chemical reaction that we're going to look at here is quite simple because we are physicists. So it's a simple reduction of silver ions to silver. So this experiment that, that you are going to see now is we're going to take a nanostructured surface, we're going to put it into silver nitrate and the structure here will absorb, it will generate charge carriers and we use the electron to reduce the silver ion to silver. So what we will see is the nucleation of silver particles. Yeah? And this way we know and via the amount of silver we, we know roughly how efficiently has this reaction occurred. So how efficiently have we absorbed light here. Okay, we are using titanium dioxide. Okay, so that's a wide band gap semiconductor doesn't absorb in the um, visible but you can make it nicely absorbing in the visible uh, via um, generating it in a little bit of a more dirty manner so that it has oxygen vacancy centers. And the nice thing is that this way you have a trick when you fabricate titanium nitrate that um, you can change the extinction coefficient of this. So you have a knob where you can control the absorption. And now we use this mode, Dimitri, that you just wanted to know more about, this quasi-bound state in the, con in, the, in the continuum. So we make these little ellipses and we angle them a bit so that we get these really sharp optical modes. Okay, and now we play with this concept that a very briefly set of critical coupling which says we can get the largest amount of energy absorbed here if we match the coupling strength to the outside that we can now change via the angle between our resonators to the internal absorption, so, so to the extinction coefficient of this material. So we can change the extinction coefficient via making our titanium dioxide a little bit dirty we can change the coupling to the outside, the strength, via tilting these ellipses, um, by like changing the leg angle here. So if we make these two coincide, do we really get the largest absorption? And meaning, do we get the largest amount of silver deposited? Okay? And then we can scale this to the wavelength of interest simply by scaling these. Okay, so now just very briefly to the, to the summary. So we have three different parts of titanium dioxide with different amounts of vacancy centers here. You see optical images here. This has a very low amount, medium amount. This absorbs a lot. You see here, we look at a variety of different angles to change the coupling strength. Obviously, if you have the lowest amount of absorption, you will have the highest field enhancement. So that's nice. But then again, then you have little overall absorption. 
so you wouldn't generate a lot of charge carriers. But this mode, as we tilt, is now really nice and sharp. Yeah, this quasi-bound state in the continuum. In the medium one, where we have larger extinction, more defects in the material, we see the field enhancement is less, the mode isn't as sharp, and in the largest one, well, we kind of overdid it. You see a little bit of the optical mode here, but basically no field enhancement. So this sample here was useless. Okay, but now we do the experiment. So we have a computer um, generated reading out of how many silver particles get de uh, deposited. And this is the interesting plot. So, so this shows the tilting angle, yeah? coupling strength to the outside. This shows the amount of silver deposited, roughly. These are the two ma uh, materials. This is the low extinction material. This is the medium extinction material. So the first important observation is the low extinction material wins, yeah? which, is, uh, which is really surprising. Because so far, like in photocatalysis, right, if you want to absorb in thin layers, and you need to absorb in thin layers, otherwise your carriers will recombine before they catalyze the chemical reaction, or if you think about photovoltaics before you know, you like get them out, um, you want a large amount of extinction. Well, if you play cleverly with your optical design via this trick of critical coupling, the low extinction material wins. Meaning, this opens up now a much wider space of materials to be used in photocatalysis. And you also see there's a particular high point. So there's a particular angle, and again, angle controls coupling strength to the outside where we deposit the largest amount of silvers. If you then do your critical coupling theory, so temporal coupled mode theory, and you calculate at which angle do you get critical coupling, again, where the coupling strength to the outside equals to the absorption in your pillars, well, you see it's here. And if we plot without cheating uh, the curve that I've just shown underneath, you see that's exactly the same angle um, where, we, where we have the largest amount of silver. Yeah, so like the two takeaways here are you can do a lot in the viewpoint of like energy conversion if you play with these concepts of matching internal absorption with coupling strength from the outside and you can use nanostructured surfaces, speak nanophoratonics, to match that. Yeah? And this way you have many more knobs that you can play with and a much larger amount of materials to uh, choose for in like this case for energy conversion. Well, obviously you, you would not want it to make silver but yeah well so the next step is now to look at this with more um with more relevant um reaction yeah and like actually like here like at monash there like is like an effort in this um area in chemical engineering via the um via the woodside partnership here as well okay just lastly this is the last science slide um what else is like currently topical in this field well one thing is of course like optimizing yeah so we have used extremely simple like concepts you know discs ellipses, moving something a little bit here, like a little bit there, but like can we use machine learning, for example, in order to optimize such system? This is work already like a little bit older, but done by Shang Shu Lu from my group, who's now a lecturer at um, Exeter. He used metal nanoparticles for color generation. So he shaped them so that the color that they give off yeah, is controlled to reproduce color images. And you know, you like get a certain gamut depending on the material that you choose and the control of your nanofabrication. But he then used machine learning to find out what's actually the optimum unit cell to extend the gamut given the material that you have. Yeah? So that's a very simple example where like, you could use machine learning. And then lastly, uh, this is something very exciting that we do uh, with the collaborations that I have with my team at Imperial College, is to, make, to use these concepts of wavefront shaping, but not in space, but in time. So you want to play with the with the fraction now in uh, the time domain and not in the spatial domain, meaning you are not nanostructuring your material interface spatially, but you are nanostructuring it quotation marks in time, meaning you want to change its permittivity yeah, uh, over like a very drastic scale uh, in, in a, a time frame that's much smaller than a temporal optical cycle. And this way you can, for example, perform Young's double slit experiment, not in space, but you can perform it in time. So if you take such a material, and unfortunately there's only one at the moment, but the good thing is it's ITO, so it's something that uh, gets used quite, quite, um, quite often in like opto, op, optoelectronics. And via the third uh, order uh, 
a, a third order nonlinearity, the so-called nonlinear optical care effect, you, you change the refractive index here quite drastically. Okay? So if you now have two pulses that are very short coming after each other, you can get interference now in time. So you see Young's typical double slit diffraction spectrum, but now not in space. Yeah, think about the picture I showed by Berenice Abbott at the start of like the water bath, but you see it in time. So you see now uh, uh, basically light at many different frequencies generated, but with an envelope that corresponds as if it would be the diffraction. Yeah? So like this, this, this concept of playing with time, uh, time varying materials and time diffraction and, and like then of course whole things like PT symmetry comes in. You could try to then also like nanostructure this. Um, yeah, it's quite quite interesting. Okay, so there are uh, way too many people uh, over the years that I need to acknowledge here. So just some collaborators that have been trusted and great over the years. So Ricardo Sapienza and Rupert Dalton. So uh, at Imperial, Ricardo is heading the time variant program there. Um, Hao Ran Ren, who is now here, who will do great work with metasurfaces. Markus Schmidt uh, from um, IPHT, the Leibniz Institute in Jena. He's working in optical fibers. Uh, Andrea Bragas, uh, Buenos Aires, where I did a lovely sabbatical years ago for the acoustic work. Andreas Titel and Emiliano Cortez for the chemistry work. Uh, yeah, thanks for sticking out. Sorry for going over time. I should say the like, talk is online at our new Monash uh, server for uh, slides that we're going to talk about at some point. So you can go there if you want to see it again or not. Uh, I've also put like a couple of other papers in here that we've done over the years that you can click on. Thank you. <laughs>